Film and TV narratives invite us to make emotional connections with fictional on-screen characters. We are so predisposed to this that it is almost an intuitive response to say we identify with characters, we find them relatable, we see ourselves reflected in them. Their joy, their sadness, their fear. Emotional response to characters is at the heart of film and television and contributes to much of what we find so appealing about screen narratives. Recent approaches to film and TV studies have taken to exploring this emotional engagement more deeply. In particular, cognitive film theory has emerged as an interdisciplinary approach, drawing on branches of neuroscience, film studies and art philosophy to grapple with the nature of this connection between audiences and characters. In doing so, it is apparent that our emotional responses are considerably more complex than we perhaps first realised. Moving beyond the more colloquial phenomena of identifying, liking and relating to characters, we come to deeper questions about emotional cognition and the relationship between character engagement and our beliefs, values and ideologies. These complexities are especially revealed when the creators of screen narratives invite us to engage with characters that operate on a set of beliefs vastly different to our own. For instance, can we say that we identify with fictional serial killers, drug dealers and sadists? Can we hold positive attitudes toward them, even when at the same time we know we would loathe them in real life? In short, how can we understand our emotional engagement with morally reprehensible characters? This analysis aims to explore this question with a focus on one of the most morally reprehensible characters in narrative fiction and the title character in NBC's 2013 series, Hannibal. Played by Danish actor Mads Mikkelsen, the character of Dr. Hannibal Lecter provides a particularly provocative case for examining audience character engagement. Hannibal doesn't just manipulate and murder people, he eats them, an act so prohibited and abominable that it well and truly violates what we consider acceptable behaviour. And yet, NBC's Hannibal depicts a monster as suave as he is dangerous, as charismatic as he is malevolent. The series invites us to be seduced by Hannibal, while at the same time confronting us with his irredeemably evil nature. Using a cognitive film theory approach, we can explore the way in which the showrunners cue us to have this conflicting response, and how we accommodate these opposing feelings within our own psyche. The central argument of this analysis is that we can understand our emotional engagement to Hannibal as a complex intertwining of affective processes that can shift in nature and intensity in response to aesthetic and narrative features. There's a lot here to unpack, and so this analysis will be served as a three-course meal. All these elements combined will help us to gain insight into how we account for our feelings towards characters we find morally reprehensible. Firstly, we need to examine how the showrunners invite us to respond to Hannibal's character. In other words, what aesthetic and narrative features they employ to engage us emotionally. An interesting place to start. Hannibal Lecter is a legend in narrative fiction. After first appearing in Thomas Harris's original novels, he was later cemented as a cultural icon with Anthony Hopkins' portrayal in the film adaptation of Silence of the Lambs. Audiences are well acquainted with Hannibal the Cannibal. However, NBC's series is distinct in a number of ways. Being a screen adaptation, there is the obvious audiovisual element that the literary version does not have. And while the film adaptations share the audiovisual features afforded by screen mediums, the TV series is again distinguished by its long-form narrative structure. Three seasons of Hannibal have aired, with a total of 39 episodes. That's a lot of time in which the audience is engaging with the character. The TV format also fits well with the creative vision of the series. Writer and executive producer Brian Fuller commented that every moment of the series consciously plays with the juxtaposition of gorgeousness and visceral terror, with the effect, at times, of slowly luring the audience into a sense of being in collusion with Hannibal. The long-form narrative structure afforded by television lends itself well to this slow luring, as with each episode we are drawn deeper and deeper into Hannibal's world. Furthermore, our view of Hannibal is frequently filtered through the perspectives of the other characters around him. Their interactions showcase Hannibal as an honourable and even gentle person, who displays an old-world European charm. In the very first episode of the series, we encounter an almost compassionate display from Hannibal as he holds the hand of Abigail Hobbs, a young girl who has been hospitalised after her father attempted to slit her throat. 
we see his association with high society and even a dry sense of humor. Before we begin, you must all be warned. Nothing here is vegetarian. <laughs> bon appetit. He is continually calm, polite, and restrained. Of course, it was Hannibal that provoked the attack on Abigail. That's not roast lamb. And underneath the calm exterior, Hannibal is a cold-blooded killer. Our intertextual knowledge and omniscience in the narrative give us more information than the other characters and is a key part of how we engage with Hannibal's character. Firstly, it exemplifies this idea of collusion that Fuller referred to. By sharing in Hannibal's secret, we enter into a sort of sinister fellowship with him, one where we are complicit in his crimes. Secondly, it creates tension between our impression of Hannibal as a monster and as a man who manifests qualities that invite approval. The narrative feeds us these moments of Hannibal's humanity, only to leave us an unpleasant aftertaste as we are reminded of his true nature. The showrunners most effectively create this tension by positioning us to see things from the perspective of Will Graham, a criminal profiler recruited by the FBI to help with their investigations. The use of Will's point of view is a technique that is clearly established right from the very beginning of the series. In the opening scene, Will surveys a bloody crime scene, and the audiovisual cues then take us inside Will's mind. We hear his heartbeat, the colours get brighter, and the room comes into greater clarity. We see him peeling back the layers of the crime scene. It is a representation of his psychological processes, as he assumes the mind of the killer and reenacts the murder that has just taken place. From this moment on, our view of Hannibal's world is linked inextricably to Will's view. It is through his perspective that we experience the blood and gore, and his struggle to face these horrors mirrors our own. Shake it off. Keep on looking. Good. It is also through Will that we most strongly feel the lure of Hannibal, as Will is the primary target of Hannibal's seduction. Through Hannibal and Will's relationship, the series explores the idea of being drawn to something that could kill you. Even knowing the extent of Hannibal's immorality, both Will and the audience remain captivated by his character. This idea is further reinforced by the striking visuals. Poetic and grotesque, horrific yet elegant, the series has developed a unique style that simultaneously evokes revulsion and fascination. Though we rarely see the murders being committed, we follow Will as he confronts the aftermath. The bodies of the victims turned into disturbingly artful forms, and of course, meals. Fuller has explained his purposeful visual approach. Quote, If we're going to show horrible things, they have to be beautiful. I think that horror is so easy to make ugly because that is what it is intrinsically. We wanted to challenge the audience from Will's point of view as a guy who will look at things and will want to look away, but can't because they draw him to them. This tension between awe and horror, stimulated by the visuals, corresponds to our conflicting feelings towards Hannibal. There is a desire to distance ourselves, but at the same time, we are compelled to linger. So, we have a combination of aesthetic and narrative features. The long-form narrative structure, which allows for us to be slowly lured into collusion with Hannibal. The charming and charismatic version of Hannibal, conflicting with our intertextual knowledge and narrative omniscience and the use of Will's point of view to express the competing aversion and attraction to both Hannibal and the macabre, a theme that is further reinforced by the visual style. Through these features, the series invites us to engage with the character of Hannibal. But as has been shown, this invitation is loaded with tension and juxtaposing ideas. Therefore, our emotional response is likewise going to be grappling with these conflicting messages. Our attention now turns to the affective processes that make up our emotional response to Hannibal's character. While a distinction is often drawn between cognitive and affective processes, for the sake of simplicity this analysis will use these interchangeably. The term affective processes is used here to broadly refer to the dynamic psychological phenomena that shape how we connect and respond to the world. Affective processes includes a whole range of phenomena, and though there is much to explore with each of these, in the interest of time, the following will provide a brief overview of two key processes that are pertinent to transgressive characters. A process of moral evaluation that constitutes allegiance to characters, and a process of self-reflective emotional evaluation, whereby we appraise our own emotional response. Murray Smith, a formative cognitive film theorist, argues that we engage in a process of assessing a character's attitudes, traits, and actions. 
In other words, we evaluate the morality. The result of this is a more or less sympathetic or antipathetic response towards a character. If a character earns moral approval and we sustain a positive attitude towards them, this is what Smith labels allegiance. In discussing allegiance to immoral characters, Smith proposed two further distinctions. Firstly, we can form a partial allegiance, wherein we ally ourselves with some of the characters' actions and attitudes and not others. That is, we find them sympathetic despite their odious traits. However, Hannibal poses a tricky case. Firstly, he's not a typical anti-hero. The series doesn't explore his backstory, so there's no tragic fall from grace. There's no redemption arc in which he displays remorse for his actions. He doesn't even show vulnerability, except perhaps in his obsession for Will. There is an absence of moral traits for us to ally ourselves with in the first place. We can certainly see some amoral traits that might elicit a positive emotional response. His droll humour, his intelligence, even his taste for fine clothing, music, and art. However, in Smith's view, moral assessment of characters constitutes a kind of centre of gravity that these amoral factors may inflect, but not displace. Moral evaluation lies at the core of allegiance. It's hard to think of cases in which a film elicits strong sympathy towards a character largely on the basis of amoral attributes. Characters who appeal through wit or charm, for example, command our sympathetic allegiance because these amoral traits coexist in the character with at least some morally positive traits. The problem with NBC's Hannibal is that there are no morally positive traits for these positive amoral traits to coexist with. Perhaps then we can turn to Smith's second distinction, what he calls perverse allegiance, whereby we ally ourselves with an immoral character not in spite of, but rather because of their odious traits. For this, however, other factors need to come into play, such as fascination and curiosity. A second key affective process pertinent to transgressive characters is the interplay between what Anne Barch refers to as primary and secondary emotions, or meta-emotions. Barch draws on the idea that we can have emotions about our emotions, much like we can have thoughts about our thoughts. Different disciplines give varying theories on the processes that give rise to this phenomenon though Barch argues that they all involve three levels of cognitive complexity. The experience of meta-emotions comprises all three of these levels and can help us understand our conflicting response to certain characters. For example, we may laugh at Hannibal's humour, though our meta-emotions will tell us that this laughter is inappropriate. In this process, the quick and automatic reaction of laughter seems to become overlaid by the slower stimulus processing activity of higher levels. Conversely, we may feel disgust and revulsion and yet we find value and even delight in that we're presented with such an effectively stimulating experience. Even if a primary emotion has a negative valance, this can be modified by the reflective and evaluative capacity of meta-emotions. It's rare that effective processes occur in isolation. Instead, they build upon each other and are in constant interaction. Furthermore, these processes cannot be separated from their aesthetic and narrative features, as it is these features that largely make up the object of our evaluation. We now draw these together to gain insight into how affective processes can shift in nature and intensity in response to aesthetic and narrative features. As already mentioned, one of the features of NBC's Hannibal is the long-form narrative structure. We spend a lot of time with the character of Hannibal Lecter and see him in a variety of situations and interacting with other characters. While our moral evaluation may not grant that we form a true allegiance with him, the long-form narrative does give us a high degree of familiarity and partiality. Arthur Rainey argues that because we engage with fiction for entertainment, our desire to enjoy ourselves takes priority. Consequently, viewers can trade moral scrutiny for partiality and favouritism, and give characters greater moral licence to ensure that enjoyment is experienced. Building on this, Margarita Brunvage contends that television narratives are particularly effective at eliciting partiality. The long-form narrative structure has the capacity to reduce the intensity of our moral evaluations. Furthermore, a TV series has greater opportunity to draw attention away from a character's immoral behaviours or traits. This is evident with Hannibal, particularly in the earlier episodes, where we can spend 30 minutes with the charming and civilised version of his character, with only a few cleverly timed reminders of his evil nature. Additionally, though we may not form allegiance to Hannibal, we are invited to form an allegiance to Will. His character is much more likely to elicit moral approval due to our being aligned with his point of view and a recognisable similarity between his response to the horror and our own. 
As Will is seduced by Hannibal, our allegiance to him can help us to imagine that we are also being seduced. And though we may not share in Will's attraction to Hannibal, through our allegiance, we can gain an appreciation for it. The use of Will's point of view then, supplemented with our partiality towards Hannibal, can lead to an emotional engagement based on appeal and interest, rather than a moral approval or disapproval. Furthermore, Hannibal's aesthetic and narrative features are particularly effective at provoking the elicitation of meta-emotions. While our primary emotions may be reeling in disgust and squeamishness at the horrors of Hannibal's world, the series will stage a searching discussion about the toll that looking at death and darkness takes on the human psyche, appealing to us to engage in a higher level evaluation of what we are seeing. Is it me or is it becoming easier for you to look? I tell myself it's purely an intellectual exercise. Consider too, in relation to Hannibal's character, our repulsion at seeing Hannibal cook and prepare his victims. While the classical music and fine dining setting can be appraised as being entirely civilised, by playing to our capacity to evaluate our emotions on different levels, the series expertly dances with the nature and intensity of our engagement. The purpose of this analysis is not to provide conclusions about what our emotional response to Hannibal is, but rather to illustrate that we can understand our emotional engagement as a complex intertwining of affective processes that are influenced by aesthetic and narrative features. As the series of Hannibal unfolds, we are presented with conflict-laden stimuli, which in turn initiates psychological attempts to dissolve emotional tensions, to control undesirable emotions, to disambiguate themes, and to weigh art against morality. Perhaps what this analysis has demonstrated most of all is how difficult it is to fully capture the complex, multi-layered, and even downright messy nature of our emotional engagement. As a final note, while in trying to encompass the complexity of emotional engagement, there is also a danger of being impractically pluralistic. There is much need for further discussion about the merits of different affective processes in relation to emotional engagement, and the extent to which specific filmic features can inflict upon these. While ever screen characters continue to captivate us, particularly morally reprehensible characters, this question will remain a significant area for further consideration.